um, the way we came here was a bit funny. She just sent me the link and said, oh, look, Marce, this is very interesting. Uh, I didn't know about it. Uh, what do you think? And I opened the link and I started um, surfing and, well, discovering all the, all the project of the open book. And I thought, wow, we must go there. That was in August. We, we were both on, on holidays, separately, but on holidays. And I entered to the link. I, I started making a reservation. I, I made it as if I wanted to, to book it. And when I arrived to the end, I said, I must do it. And I said, OK, accept. Somebody had posted an, reposted an article uh, from BuzzFeed, I think, um, on Facebook. And as soon as I read the article, I, I knew that it was something I wanted to do. And so I, I went ahead and, and booked for the first week that was available, which I think was uh, more, than, more than 18 months ahead. We arrived here the 7th February uh, 2016, and we spent two weeks here. You, don't, you, you can't believe, at some moments, you can't believe what's happening. You think you are um, part of, of a film or of a fiction story. Because it's, if you see this in a film, you would say, wow, how nice. But these things don't happen in real life. But yes, they do. They do happen. And then I called my husband and said, well, this is what we're doing Christmas 2017. Uh, we're going to Scotland and running a bookshop. When I was a young lad 60 years ago, there was a bandstand here where the silver band played and there was two tennis courts in here. And then over the years, eventually they built this garden. So that's what was originally here. I used to say I was born in the main street in Wigton and I had to say, I'll rephrase that, a house in the main street. That was Gordon Henry's, the ironmonger. And I was born above that shop. The bookshop was Pollens. It was the biggest grocer's and kind of shop and that in the town where you could get all your, your food and that. And next door, Curly Tail Books, that was Mr. Stewart. He, he sold shoes. But I mean, they were like high class shoes, if you know what I mean, real leather and everything. And you had to have money, Ken, if you wanted a pair of shoes, you need a lot of money when you were down there. But in them days, I mean, we had the, we had two creameries, we had the distillery, we had Wiley's and Garlison, which was a big farming thing, grain mill. We had Wiley's and Muldoon, was a big agricultural business as well. And you had the sawmill at Newton Stewart, 
and I say we had the distillery and the, you had the forestry work. So there was plenty of work for everybody. And now they're, they're all shut down. But when I was a youngster, we used to ferret rabbits and you'd take them up to the fishmonger and we would gather gull's eggs, cycle two mile out yeah, yeah, yeah. and gather gull's eggs. And before Beecham shut down the railway line, there was a train, they called it the Paddy, because it come across, kind of boat come across for Ireland and Paddy's Irish and it went to London. And John Rennie, when the game was in season and the gull eggs, he would take them up to the train station in Newton Stewart and put them on the train to go to Smithfield Market at night. Two doors up was another shop, making shop, and it was the same small grocers and, and if you want to kind of bake or not, it was makings. But it went to fuck maybe 50 years ago, 45 years ago. And that there, that was just, that was just a house. When I booked up for this, I just thought, wow, a bookshop of my own for two weeks. Sounds fantastic. evidence that I've got a Kindle, but here I am operating a bookshop, so I've got to be a bit careful about that. <laughs> so the charger stays in there for now. And it very nearly was high noon for Wigtown in the early 90s. Traditional industries in decline, a town dying on its feet. The nearby Bladnock Creamery was the town's main employer. Last year it closed, 140 jobs were lost and overnight the local economy was devastated. But Wigtown has bloomed again since winning a Scottish Enterprise-backed competition to become a book town, a regeneration phenomenon which had started in Hay on Wye and spread across Europe. I've got things. I'm like, oh, well, you've got to try the bookshop down the road, and then there's a few others you can try as well. You come at the right time here. There's people about it, so. Yeah. Anyway, you can do what you want with them, price them up, put them out. And, uh, do you have any instructions read the pricing? Nah, you're no. getting them for free, so whatever you have. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. I might come over later with some more. Yeah, that'd be great. You can have a cup of tea or something okay, while you're here. Cool. Okay. Right. okay that'd be lovely. See ya. Bye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I'll have a look. Okay. Surprise. What I think a book town has to be increasingly is it's got to be a place where Literary culture, but culture more generally, is regarded more highly than in other places. Wow. Um, my name's Adrian Turpin. I'm the artistic director of the Wigtown Book Festival. Jane Eyre, another Jane Eyre. Or Charlotte Bronte. You know, there can yeah. be a fear of things coming in from outside. And I think you can, and I think, I hope it's one of the things that we try and do with the festival, I try and do with the festival. I, I think it is possible to balance those two things. I think it's possible to be, to, to be outward looking and at the same time to be deeply rooted in the kind of heritage and the history and the, you know, the, the sense of place and a sense of you know, people in, in, in an area, and those two things are. But if you end up talking about, if you end up talking about community as this kind of monolithic thing, that can be a very conservative with a small c 
um, thing. And I think it can kind of hold people back. So Wigtown has always had a very unique community. Um, the way that people support one another and support the activities happening in the town has always been um, different to the experience people have elsewhere. Personally, I don't see it ever becoming um, so big that it loses that really special community spirit. I think what we'll find is that people will continue to flow in and out and become part of our community while they're, while they're here. And it's one of the things that people love that they can dip in for a short period of time and then go back to their, their own lives, knowing that um, you know one of the phrases people quite often use is, I left a bit of my heart in wig time. I think the concept of the open book is absolutely fantastic. We've had people from Korea, China, New Zealand, America, Chile, all over the world. So in a way, it sort of culturally enriches the town by bringing this kind of diverse range of people here. And they then go back and you know, market the town to whatever community they've come from. I don't want to sound like it's some sort of utopia, but it's great. It's a really nice place to live. I mean, it has changed. It wasn't always like that. So when I moved back, uh, that was shortly after we'd been given the Booktown status. And a lot of the locals were very resistant to it and felt that it was something that had been imposed on them by outsiders. They, they didn't see it as their thing. But you know, 20 years down the line, you can see physically the transformation of the town, you know, boarded up shops are, are all open now. It's a different place, it's, it's completely different. Charles Dickens, yes, yes, yes. Charles Dickens. I'm gonna make a big mess here. Tessa the D'Urbervilles, Thomas Hardy. I think one thing that the book town did was it did allow Wigtown to take on a new identity and to to add to its identity, but without destroying what was there there before. And I think we've got to be aware uh, the, the, the book town has to be aware as it goes on that that um, it, that um, it's got to continue that process. That's not a finite process. Got five pound on those. Five yep. Pounds. Yep. yep, yep, five pound. That's fantastic. What part of Germany are you from? From Hamburg. Ah, I haven't been there, but I've been to a few other of the towns and cities. My name's uh, Phil Hubbard. I'm professor of urban studies at King's College London in the Department of Geography. I think one of the, the, the big things to talk about in the context of something like the Wigton uh, project and the Booktown kind of status is the fact that the Booktown idea seems to be one that would appeal to everybody. Everybody reads books at some level. It's culturally inclusive and people think about book selling as kind of socially connected. So a bookshop is a good thing to have on the high street. The trouble is that if you orientate a whole community towards selling books, then you're saying that, in a sense, that's the cultural activity that needs to be there to regenerate. It ignores all the cultures that were there before. And it's this idea that somehow the place was a cultural desert and it needs this kind of regeneration to make something happen, as if there's not, not things there happening anyway. So we do need that kind of wider sense of what creativity might be and what culture might be. Belty Books is after the iconic breed Belted Galloways, this type of cow, and we've had this bookshop and cafe for five years now. We first came to Wigton ten years ago. I, I belong to Galloway and I was very keen to move back, not necessarily to run a bookshop, but given that being to university, I thought it would, why not join? Because the people said, yes, we need more bookshops, so I'm just coming, yes. The coming town to I'm, I'm needs to keep feeling like a place where people can come and be curious about the world, be curious about 
Dumfries and Galloway, be curious about Wigtown, be curious about secondhand books, but be open to ideas and to be open to culture and particularly literary culture. I think the problem is, you know, there's a lot of creativity and culture in every community and sometimes this isn't really kind of embraced by cultural strategies that tend to kind of favour the type of art and culture which belongs to the, uh, the more vocal, the more articulate, the more educated members of communities. So Nancy, with love from Patricia, November 13th, 1948. Well. Yes, I love books. It's special. I love secondhand books. That is not enough in the 21st century to draw people to one place and to sustain it. So it's about ideas. It's about. It's almost like trying to create a, you know, the same kind of sense that you get from a vibrant small campus town, but without a university. Mm. Yeah. This is the beekeeping book from Russia. The only Russian beekeeping book in Wigton. Mm. Really interesting. Or it would be interesting if I could understand it. Here we are, Russian bees. Mm. Hey, um, so my name's Joyce Cochran and I'm a bookseller in Wigton. I co-own and run the Old Bank Bookshop uh, with my husband Ian Cochran. I grew up six miles up the road from here. Um, I went to school here and, like most of my contemporaries, left for university when I was around 17 and 18. And I came back in my early 40s. Never thought I would come back to run a bookshop in my home county. Um, the old bank came back on the market and we just jumped. Um, nowhere to live. No shelves no books <laughs> and a baby on the way <laughs> so we did the completely crazy thing and here we are with about eleven and a half thousand books a thirteen and a half year old and yeah we're still in business yeah okay that's five i think the book town idea seems totally benevolent and beneficial but literature festivals are quite elitist in many ways, so I'd be very suspicious about the idea that a singular branding for a place could actually be beneficial and include everybody. And I'm sure in the research that I found in particular, I found that these type of events tend to be exclusive and in some senses actually resented by some local people who feel that they've kind of been imposed on their community. Din. Oh, well done. Oh. <laughs> So who am I to tell you that you don't know how to spell? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're not right to take them off. Oh, well, I said the rules are flexible. <laughs> I think there's great interest in the town. People, we had customers in last week who are looking, who've been coming twice a year and are looking for property here. More and more people are wanting to come. Now, the thing about that is you want to keep the town... You want the town to s develop, but you don't want it to change. It's that sort of double-edged sword. Um. It's a really difficult one. Can you encourage re regeneration without actually having gentrification? Can you have a kind of partial gentrification? The evidence so far isn't very encouraging. It suggests that when you have gentrification, it, it does become a kind of an unstoppable kind of machine Hello. and that ultimately it forces out uh, the less well off. Oh, yeah, 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 I know what this is. <laughs> You've been waiting patiently on it. Well, no, it's just a nice surprise, isn't it? <laughs> That's yours as well. But the, it being a book town doesn't actually bring any money in because it's all sold through the internet and it's only like when they have the festival to get people coming in. They don't actually spend any money. I mean, they'll go into the coffees, but they'll sit with a cup of coffee and read a book for three hours. But they're taking up spaces for everybody else. You know, people that do want to come in and have a meal, they can't get in because they're sitting there reading the book. Ideal bookshelf. Jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> Isn't that just wonderful? I'm sorry. I'm such a traditional bookseller. <laughs>
Dalmellington was also in contention for Booktown. A decade on, it's painfully clear that Wigtown's gain was this town's loss. If we had got to Booktown, or indeed something similar, that would have been the start of something good, I believe. We're not jealous because Wigtown won it fair, but we do envy them, yes. I think anybody would, because if you go to Wigtown now, as I've done several times, it's a different place. What are they saying? We had, we had, they spent about three weeks at the open book in, in a January. And, uh, yeah, we had them over for dinner. They just hung out with us. So. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Open book seems to have worked phenomenally well, um, but we also need people who want to live here all the time, though, you know, and it, it's very difficult for local people to be able to afford housing and very difficult for younger people to stay here. I mean, Galloway, as in most of rural Scotland, has shed young people to other parts of Scotland and Britain for generations and more and more people retire to places like Galloway. And we need to try and offer people the opportunity to stay here if they want to. I think it's really hard. If you've got a situation where a town is being described by you know, the media, by the local politicians, it's having its kind of heart torn out of it, when it becomes that stigmatised, it's very hard to then you know, come to anybody who says, we need something new here and say, no, we don't, we don't need that. We don't need that. Because they will create the idea that the place is a kind of, as you say, it's a desert, it's waiting to be regenerated, repopulated, because there's nothing there, rather than taking a hard look and thinking, well, what actually is here? What, have, what, what has this place got? How can we regenerate and improve the lives of the people who are here at the moment, rather than how can we bring in new people who will, you know, through some virtuous activity, some creative work, will somehow pull the whole place up? You know, empower local people to do something within their local town appears to be a much better way of proceeding. I'm going to give you one pound coin. There you go. Three. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Perfect. There's a story waiting inside behind.